Welcome, everyone. We are um, super excited to have uh, Karen and Eric here, um, who both of whom uh, spent some time in the New York area. And, uh, you know, Karen is still sort of here, sometimes in Florida. Um, but uh, welcome, uh, both are welcome back anytime. I would ask that uh, anybody who is not uh, Karen and Eric to uh, turn off their cameras so we can focus our attention on, uh, on these guys here. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, and if this is your first new to VC, my name is Charlie O'Donnell and I'm a partner, uh, the sole partner at Brooklyn Bridge Ventures. I focus on pre-seed and seed stage startups in and around New York. And we do this series to try and uh, expose as many folks to the venture process as possible who are either uh, new, just getting started, uh, aspiring angels, or the kind of folks who uh, think about applying to open VC positions, but really want to know a little bit more about uh, what it's like. So. Um, I'll ask uh, both of them to give a little short update of uh, intro to themselves and their funds. Karen, you wanna kick us off? Yes, hi. Uh, well, great to have so many folks on this call being interested in venture and startups. We, we love that. Uh, and I am a founding partner of Bloomberg Beta. We are backed by Bloomberg and focus on seed and pre-seed stage companies that are making work better. And been a long time venture investor uh, before starting Bloomberg Beta, was at SoftBank uh, and led the team that reviewed all new investments. And then uh, before that was uh, I, uh, working with Mike Milken on his education and media investing and got my start as a founder. So uh, really hope we get a chance to hear from you all about some of your questions. Well, a quick uh, funny anecdote about Karen. Um, ages ago, I'm going to say this is probably 2008, I got invited to a New York football giants uh, playoff watching party at um, Hill Country Barbecue. Uh, or maybe it was just a game because they were playing the Redskins. The Redskins probably weren't in the playoffs at the time. But uh, and there was a guy sitting across from me who looked very familiar and I could not figure out for the life of me who this guy was. And it was uh, only a little while into the meal that I realized it was Seth Myers. And Seth Myers is like the college roommate of Mike Lazaro, or they, they know each other from college or something like that. And Mike introduced Karen to Seth and said, uh, Seth, I want you to meet Karen. Karen's one of the top VCs in New York. And Seth's response was, wow, um, well, I only found out what a VC was about 15 minutes ago. So that sounds very nice for you. <laughs> so um, I, I, I do think that is true and, and one of my favorite people to work with. Um, and right back at you. And, and, cool. and it shows how great the New York community is that we have all these people who are kind of in our ecosystem, right? For sure, for sure. And uh, Eric Wiesen, who um, formerly at uh, RRE, now of Bullpen, who I've also known for a very long time. And uh, Eric, you wanna give us a little bit of uh, intro to what you're up to? Yeah, of course. Um, as Charlie mentioned, I'm, I'm originally from New York, but I, I no longer live in the area. I live here in the evil San Francisco Bay Area, but I did mostly grow up here, so I feel like I have an excuse. Um, but I cut my teeth in New York Venture, again, as Charlie said, at RRE, first as an associate and then as a partner before moving back out here in 2014 <clears throat> and joining up with Bullpen. Bullpen mostly invests actually in post-seed, um, so we sort of actually have seed relatively well bracketed. Um, on this panel. Bullpen is mostly investing in a group of companies that have gotten somewhere interesting on their pre-seed or seed capital, but are not yet ready for a whole bunch of reasons to raise a big institutional series A. And so that tends to lead us to invest in a lot of more out of favor categories, more out of favor founder types and underrepresented founders. Um, and it, it's sort of a very gratifying way to identify maybe a little more unusual left of center companies um, and sort of get them back into the mainstream. 
it's, it's sort of funny as I think about this panel, it's pretty rare at this point in my life that I'm on a VC panel where I actually have the least experience. Um, but I think both Karen and Charlie have been doing this job longer than I have. Charlie, wow. you started at USV in 2005, right? Yeah, that's right. And and actually, I did a few deals before that um, late stage direct investments on behalf of the General Motors Pension Fund. So we used to do both fund investments um, and directs. So I actually started in 01. And I think sometime in August, if I got the math right, I will have literally spent half my life in venture. <laughs> I got a ways to go, but I, I do remember coming up through New York and there weren't a whole lot of us out there. So all, all three of us were in kind of a small group of, at, at this point now, much larger, but back then I think there were kind of 12 or 15, you know, kind of call it younger VCs kind of working our way up. So it's, I think it's a community that has stayed pretty tight and happy to be here and, and give, you know, whatever benefit our, our gray hairs all have. Cool. Um, so mine are down here, but, uh, so, so let me set a little context for this. So, um, you know, we're, we're focused on due diligence and, you know, obviously there are, uh, some deals where you, you don't have a lot of time to make a decision, other deals where you, you've gotten to know a little bit of the space a little more, maybe a little bit more of the founder, but, but just for context, um, what, you know, somebody pitches you something and, and you decide to dive in and, and do some work. And when somebody says, you know, you have to do due diligence on this, what is your, your goal of that? What are you actually trying to find out? Eric, do you want to sort of kick us off? Yes. And, and I want to distinguish actually two things because they have the same name, but they're very, very different. Um, the first is business due diligence. Um, and the second is legal due diligence. And in, in a venture deal, these are pretty sequential, right? So you generally don't start doing legal due diligence until you've made a decision that you want to invest in the company. Um, but legal due diligence is a whole separate set of activities, almost entirely conducted by lawyers and paralegals. That's not mostly, I think, what we should talk about today. Although if people yeah, have questions yeah. about legal diligence, happy to get into that because one of my former lives, I was actually a corporate lawyer working on startups. Um, so I, I had some time in the trenches there too. But what, Char what Charlie, what you're asking about here, business diligence, is ultimately the exercise in how are you going to get conviction about making an investment or not making an investment. And you know, due diligence is a, is a term of art, right? Legal and business term of art. But what it ultimately means is what work are you going to do? What do you want to learn? so that you feel like you know enough about a business and the people who run it and the market in which they operate, such that you know, yes, I think on a risk-adjusted risk basis, this is an investment I wanna make, or no, it's not. And at a high risk level- Risk-adjusted being a really key word there. Risk-adjusted being a really key word here because everything we invest in, in early stage venture, whether it's pre-seed, seed, post-seed, post -seed, series A, it's risk capital. Right? It's why it's expensive capital for founders. It's why it's expensive capital for limited partners. It's always risky and almost anything we invest in, we know we could lose all of our money. So the job isn't to gain certainty. The job is to believe that relative to its competitors, the price that you have to pay and what you can learn, you think you have a better, you know, you have a better chance than not of making a high return on that investment or that it fits your strategy. I'm going to pause because that's a that's an overview answer, but there's a lot of places we can go with that. Yeah, and I'll I'll, I'll tack on a a question to that uh, to Karen. Um, when you are um, trying to figure out uh, whether you can get um, you know conviction on something especially on a risk adjusted basis. Let's talk about that, that certainty. Eric described it as sort of, you know, uh, more times than not, or, or like how comfortable, can you actually describe how comfortable you're supposed to be, right? Cause you're, it's not a hundred percent certainty. 
Yeah, and, and it's it. So there's a couple of things that I really liked Eric's perspective or way he framed it. I mean, the reality is there is a lot of risk. That's what we do. And I'm mostly trying to find upside potential uh, more so just because the risk of turning something down that ends up being huge is greater than the risk of not losing of losing your money, so to speak. And so you can only lose one extra money. Exactly. You can make many, many access times your but money. It, yeah. And if you miss out on the next, um, let's say Mongo, because we want to, you know, like think about New York or, you know, one of, uh, one of the big flyers, then that, that's, that's a much, a much greater, a gr much greater loss. So I spend a lot of my diligence and, and also I'll, I'll caveat one more thing. The longer you've been doing this, the more we've seen how things can go awry, right? So, and, and that reality with anybody who's thinking of making the leap into starting a company um, or if you're early in venture, like you, we can always find a reason for a company not to work. Like the reality is we've, we've seen the playbook, you know, there, the, and there's so many things that make this a really hard endeavor for, for somebody to take on. So a lot of my diligence is really spent on identifying what I think those key things are that are going to be the ones that are going to be the most serious challenges that a founder is going to have to face. And then spending time with the founder to see how she or he thinks through it, because I'm I'm mostly diligencing, can I trust this person or this team to figure out all these challenges that could be on the roadmap ahead? So, you know, it's Karen, funny, you... Charlie, can I jump in for one second? Yeah, John, go ahead. It's funny because part of your question was sort of like almost the mental state of the investor or even the emotional state of the investor. And, you know, I, I, think you're, I think you're a poker player, right? And, and you know, when you're playing poker, I feel like I do. I don't normally. I feel like I do it enough in my job. Well, you know, the reason I bring this up is, you know, when you get dealt a pair of rags, right? You get dealt a 7-4 offsuit. There's no emotional risk in that hand because unless you're going to do something weird, you're probably going to fold. It's when you get dealt two really strong starting cards, that's when you actually start to feel nervous. And so, you know, part of your question was like, how certain are you? How do you feel? I'm never at my most, I'm at my most anxious when I'm about to make a brand new investment. Um, which is ironic since my, my thing right after this is a term sheet negotiation discussion. And so I'm always at my like most elevated when I'm about to make a new investment because that's actually the time of maximum risk. Um, passing is easy. Right, right. Because you are mentally there, but you, so you have a lot invested. You have a lot emotionally invested. And to Karen's point, we've all been doing this long enough to know even though I really like this company and I like its prospects and I think it's going to be successful, there are a hundred ways it could all go to hell. Well, and, and let me ask you about, I mean, so first of all, like we've all been doing this for a while and inherent in that is if you are still in the industry for as long as we have been, you must have seen success early because if you didn't see success early enough, no one you don't have a good enough track record to continue investing in, in the industry. And so I, I found a particularly interesting Karen's point of over time, you see more and more ways that something can go wrong. So I'll ask both of you and Karen, because you said it, I'll, I'll ask you first, do you have to kind of continually, continually like reset or, or check yourself because every year, you learn new and interesting ways that companies can screw themselves up or get screwed over by the market or, or, or what have you. Um, but then you have to look at each new deal optimistically in, in, in some sense. Is, is that, how hard is that? Yeah, I mean, and so, so <laughs> when I was at SoftBank, I was in charge of shutting down Webvan. That was one of my projects. And, and just so everybody knows, not the same SoftBank that like not the yeah. vision fund is there are many it was, still, it was still big is it was still big at its time i mean they were putting you know crazy amounts of they had a, a one and a half billion dollar fund which at the time was like one of the largest um and they were they were writing really big checks even by today's standards but today with their multi hundred billion you know kind of thing it's it's on a totally different scale but the reality is there was this online grocery deliverer 
that was early in the thinking. And Sequoia was our co-investor. And Sequoia, you know, saw WebBAM fail, but still went into Instacart, right? And as a result, they were able to get that kind of opportunity. And I think that's the kind of thing that you have to be very reflective on is like what's changed, what's different about the team, you know, and 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 reflect on that. I think people who go, it, founders that go in to pitch investors, there's two types of investors. It, it, I mean, there's many types of investors, but it, it, at least there's a nexus between people who are looking to find reasons to pass and people who are looking to find reasons to say yes. And I try and put myself in the camp of being somebody who's trying to find the reason to believe because like I said, you can always find reasons to pass. And so I just want to see some really thoughtful uh, perspective and that somebody's spent time thinking through some of the challenges and at least has early answers to it and good history and creativity around how to navigate when there are challenges that are going to arise. You know, it's it's interesting that you put the two sets of investors that way, because I actually consider myself somebody who is looking for reasons to pass, which may surprise you because of how early I go. But to some extent, I start out super excited about a deal the moment I decide to take a meeting. And so I actually have a fairly high bar to even take a meeting. Like I probably take less pitch meetings um, live pitch meetings than most people at my stage in terms of doing, um, you know, uh, pre-seed or stuff on a PowerPoint or whatever. I probably only take two or three a week as opposed to two or three a day, which is, you know, some people will do. Um, but I, I start out with, could I see myself doing this deal? And I'm already mentally in the space of like, here, this could work out. Like this could be a thing that works. And then I, you know, nine times out of 10, it fails in the meeting because you realize you, you, you don't share the same vision or the, the depth and quality of thinking isn't there or any number of reasons. So I um, start out optimistically and then fail very fast as opposed to like, you know, I'm, I, I find reasons to pass as opposed to like looking. I, I hope I don't find reasons, right? I hope at the end of the meeting, I'm like, I'm still where I was at the beginning of this meeting, but normally, uh, you know, something kind of uh, comes up. Um, Eric, I want to turn to you for a moment and, and maybe we can sort of break down what are the, the risks and the reasons and, and, and what you see as like, your priority checklist of um, where are the biggest risks that you're trying to uncover? Um, are you trying to uh, learn something about the way the founder uh, operates? Are you trying to learn the market? Um, you know, where, where do you rank? Like, okay, this is the most important thing I need to know. And then, you know, and then maybe on the other side, like, is there anything that you, feel that other people dive into where you feel like it's just not a big risk and maybe people shouldn't care as much as they do? Uh, yes, for that second one, I'll get to that. Um, so here, here's another way I think you can cut the universe of investors, because I think, again, if, if I think about my sort of basic framework, due diligence is all about like tuning the signal that's gonna tell you whether you have conviction or not. And that signal can come from a bunch of different places. And I think it varies based on which kind of investor archetype you are. Because I think there are investors who fundamentally invest and derive signal from the people, right? From the founders. They want to find founders that they want to bet on. And they don't necessarily care that much about the product that they've built or even some of the dynamics in the market that they operate. They sort of believe great founders can, can beat, you know, beat the odds. Others are much more markets driven, right? I think their fundamental question is, is this a market that is ripe for disruption by new players? Are there favorable forces either because of sclerotic competition or because of changes right, in regulations or any other number of things that this is now a good time to enter this market? And I think the third is products, right? I think there are investors who are deep in product, often who have history of operations in product and who 
have an intuitive feeling for a product that will be adopted either by a consumer or by a business by a business user. And so I, I think you kind of want to know if you're pitching a particular investor, which camp they generally fall into. Um, so for, for me, I tend to be actually more mostly a markets investor. Um, I tend to think, right, that if the, if the market is really available to new players, that's kind of what gives you your opportunity to try to go build a big company. I think if a really, really great founding team goes into a market that is not particularly amenable to new entrants, it's going to be a real struggle. Um, and so a lot of the diligence that I do is trying to understand what are the customer dynamics? What are sort of the growth vectors inside of that market? What's changed that makes this a good market to go into, whether that's a tech, an enabling technology change, a regulatory change, a competitive change, right? There are often reasons why now's a good time to build a company in space XYZ. Um, ironically, the, the second question you asked is, is there a thing that I think a lot of investors go into that I think is probably overly important to maybe my peers. My main answer, number one and two and three is TAM. Um, a lot of VCs are absolutely fixated on total addressable market. And I think TAM is mostly a mirage that VCs create to make themselves either feel good about saying yes or feel bad, good about saying no. In most cases, they're wrong. There's a hundred ways you can cut what a market looks like. And look, some of the best investments I've ever made were in companies where the market was extremely small when the company was getting started, but quite large when the company was finally ready to exit. And so I, I think, again, when I hear one of my portfolio companies recounting to me, oh, I'm talking to you know, VC ABC, and she's asking me about the TAM, my advice usually is cut off the conversation because as soon as a VC says the word TAM, they're gonna pass. I think yeah. that's, I think that's right. a and I'm smiling because it's so true. I mean, I, I feel like it's 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 one of those things that people use to justify their decision more so than it being founded because some of the best opportunities we've had have been in, uh, founders who've been very focused on, a, on what was a relatively narrow problem and they just nailed it and then kept expanding around it to new customer extensions and you know, profiles of customers. And it's true for consumer businesses and B2B, I mean, Charlie, go back to your history, right? Like what was the TAM for Twitter, right? It was either all of media- Was it all of media or- Or it's zero. And it just depends on what you think. And if you think it's all of media, then you make the investment. And if you think it's zero because no one's ever made money on short form blogging, then you think it's zero and you pass. But it's also true for Snowflake. Like what was the, what was the TAM for Snowflake? in 2015 when they started it inside of Sutter Hill, like it was zero because like Redshift had just launched and like there wasn't a product like this because it wasn't possible and nobody knew they needed it. And now it's hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars. So it's just, it's, it's kind of a dumb question. There are, I guess it's sort of a ratchet one way and not the other, right? There are- It markets. sounds like a smart question. Well, yeah, it sounds like a smart question and it's very good at making the investor feel good about their decision. Um, but I think looking at competitive dynamics or regulatory dynamics is much more useful than looking at TAM in general. Yeah. Right. And I wholeheartedly agree. The one area where I've had a trouble around TAM have been, there's so many HR tech kind of opportunities that have come our way. Um, we focus on the future of work. So uh, we, we end up with talent tech a lot. And I, I, I'm, eagerly awaiting somebody to prove that something can get to be a sizable enough company past a certain revenue bar. And for whatever reason, it seems like these companies get to a certain scale and then very few of them make it past into the billions of dollars. Well, and I, I would argue maybe in that case that it, it is almost more competitive dynamic than it is necessarily yeah. that there like, aren't enough people hiring or something like that, right? That's the point. That's um, <laughs> So let's talk about some of the ways in which you actually get comfortable on some of these things. And, and you know, one question would be um, whether um, your main source of getting comfortable is inside the meeting with the founder or outside of the meeting, um, you know, either references or your own research or all of that sort of stuff. So let's say I pitch you in an introductory meeting, 
you get interested enough to want to do some work on it, is your likely next step to have a next meeting with me to do the due diligence as the founder? Or are you poking around externally trying to figure out you know, something about your network or, or handing something off to your junior team members to go off and, you know, write a report on a, on a space. So I usually start before I take a meeting, I try and do reference checks where I can. And that's also part of the thing that, again, if you're a founder on this call, the introduction signal is an important one too. Like who you get to make the connection um, starts diligence for what it's worth. And like, so reference it's, it's, checks more on the person than the, than the space or the idea. Yeah, mostly reference checks on the person mm -hmm. before, before I take a meeting. And again, this is best laid plans. Things have been moving really quickly during the last, you know, whatever, a couple of quarters, year, you know. That, so sometimes you don't have the luxury of being able to check people out before you take the meeting, um, just based on the time frames of these things. But a lot of times I try and diligence a person before I take the meeting where I can at least start some of that diligence. Mm -hmm. And then the time I spend with them is much more focused around, like I said, how are they, why do I think this is going to be a big opportunity? Do I think this person is well positioned to do tackle it? And then after the meeting, we'll do more diligence around the product. Uh, and just to show you the breadth of, um, variability among VCs. I almost never do any due diligence on who the founder is beforehand. Uh, and um, I tend to do it. And it's funny because people are very important to me and character is very important to me, but I also kind of wish they skipped the bio part at the beginning because I, I actually try and weave who they are and how they got to this in the conversation of what they're working on. And so my, my, in an ideal world, I sort of ask a lot of questions, go down deep. And if I feel like um, they can go down as, 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 as deep as I need them to on the call, then I might get curious as to like, how do they even get there? How do they know that? How do they come to this idea? Um, and, but if they came at it because they were the paying customer and they are the for foremost expert in the space or because they're a curious hobbyist that just, you know, just kind of went nuts on an area and, and, and decided they were gonna be self-taught. Like, I'm not so totally sure that I care uh, as much. So I go in pretty blind but, to people. But I'll say, I, I agree with that. I'm more just looking for, has the person done something exceptional mm -hmm. and, and getting, starting to get some insights on, you know, are, like, even do I think they're going to be able to hire? Is it somebody's people are going to want to work with? And then I should also say, we also try and test the product where we can before we meet with the company, just so we are trying to do both of those. So, that we have the meeting be a little bit more productive where we can. Gotcha. Okay, so so Eric, you you like something. Where are you going next? Spend more time with the founder or outside? Yeah, so um, some of, for me, some of this is a little bit bullpen specific um, because we are, I mean, in this sense, almost the diametric opposite of Bloomberg Beta and Karen's firm because you know, whereas you guys have, Bloomberg Beta has like a very specific universe that you want to address, like future of work. And, and that's, that's a thesis that I think can go really, really deep. We are the opposite, right? We're, because we're stage specific, we are totally thesis agnostic, um, but we have a very, very particular buy box around company metrics. So I actually am more like you in this way, Charlie, I don't do diligence on a founder when it comes in, but we actually asked the founder to send either a summary or even an Excel spreadsheet before the meeting to let us know, are we in the right zone from a metrics perspective? And that relates to paving capital, either revenue or, or, or user numbers, growth rate, margin structure, burn, size of team. If it's not inside the buy box for bullpen, we just pass automatically um, because we have a very particular universe of companies that we want to address, just different universe. 
So when something comes in, it's already been qualified in that way. Um, so we know we're at least in the right zone from a stage perspective. Going through the meeting, I, I will say, I mean, I'll, I'll speak only for myself, although I suspect this is true for a lot of investors. I usually know in the first five or seven minutes if I'm actually interested or not. Um, and so if I'm not, then the rest of the meeting is mostly just trying to understand, learn something interesting, and maybe try to deliver something of value at the end. If I am, and, and by the way, as a little bit of a cheat code, if you get through all of your slides, if you're pitching a VC, if you get through all you're of your interested. slides, it has not gone well. Um, if we don't get past slide four, the meeting has gone very well. Because if I'm interested, it's probably something that I've thought at least a little bit about, have an opinion about in some manner, and know that I know much, much less than the founder. So I am probably spending our 30 or 45 minutes in the introductory call asking a lot of questions to try to build up enough of a base of information so I even know what the next set of questions are. So when we get to the end of that, quest that, end of that first meeting, it usually ends with me saying, okay, here are the three or four things that I really want to know more about to understand, do I like this business or not? But I will, I'm usually pretty, pretty explicit. I'm intrigued by this business or by the people who run it or both. And so here are the things I want to dive deeper on. And Charlie, to your question, it can be any of the three things that you named, right? Sometimes it really is just, hey, we had 45 minutes. That wasn't enough to get through the type, the things I want to talk to the founder about. Let's book another hour for the day after tomorrow. Or no, the questions I have relate to data or market research, at which point I'll probably loop in my analyst. Um, who's good at that sort of thing and frankly faster at that sort of thing than I am. Um, and he and I will work together to figure out what do we want to understand about the company's operating data and data that we can bring to bear to get a sort of clearer picture of what's happening inside of the, of the evidence that we've been shown. And then yes, to the extent that we have nodes on our network that are experts in these things, right? So if an HR tech comes in, I'm going to talk to either some HR founders or the heads of HR and some of the bigger companies that we work with to say, hey, this thing came in. It seems really smart, but I last had an operating role many years ago. Is this still how the world works? Um, does this actually solve a problem for you? Um, and that ultimately leads to both customer calls and calls with potential customers. Um, I, I have a strongly held view that customer calls in a, in a B2B company should be the very, very last diligence item only because they're so annoying to the customers when then VCs don't invest and the customer's time was wasted. So I'm usually pretty clear with founders that if I'm making customer calls, it means I'm now in the mode of looking for reasons to say yes. Um, and the customer calls are confirmatory, at least in part. But the potential customer calls are really, really useful too. So if you can identify the profile of company that tends to buy a particular startup's product, and you go say to them, hey, listen, like here's the demo for this product. Would you trial this? Would you buy it? That, that kind of real world talk directly to customers or potential customers in a B2B company is probably the most important thing that I do. So, and hey, real quick, I want to highlight just because I, I wholeheartedly agree. And I just, for all the founders on this call and, and also for the VCs, like, Customers are a founder's most precious resource. And so they really should be saved to the end in terms of diligence, just because it, it is annoying, you know, to, for these, it, it takes up time of your, one of your most precious resources. So you really only want to have that happening when the investor is very serious. And so we, as part of our diligence, try and introduce new customers as a way of getting insight because if anything, it's helpful to the founder, it's all upside, it's potential new customers, but we try not to uh, tap into their customer resources until like we're talking terms with you, we're getting really close to getting over the finish line. And it's just a good, really good point to mention. And then there's one more thing I wanted to emphasize, which Charlie, it's kind of a blend of what you and Eric had said, which was the first five minutes are so critical. And when founders spend a lot of time just replaying their LinkedIn profile page. I'm like, oh my God, this is gonna be a long meeting. And right? I went to Stanford and then I was a management consultant and worked yeah. at McKinsey and 
Oh, it, it, and so I so I agree. Like, assume that the investor has looked at your profile, and I want to hear something that's like unique as to why this is so important to you. That I think you're going to be able to walk through walls over the next you know five to ten years to build this into a real company. Like, I think it's it, it's fine to start with the the profile, but anyway, just make sure it counts because those five minutes are. I mean, people are making split decisions. And it really needs to be impactful. I, I, I want to triple down on this because it is the it is probably the quickest way to kill an investor meeting is to give a really long winded intro. Um, if the investor is interested, there'll be plenty of time to talk about history and lessons learned and life story later. Spending the first even three minutes reading, going over, forget even if it's not reading your LinkedIn highlights, if it's just like a long winded story. Don't do that. You're going to lose. By the way, the only thing I can think of that's more annoying to an investor than that is asking the investor to do that at the beginning of the conversation. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about your firm. Tell me a little bit about your firm. Don't do that. That's annoying. I pitch LPs. I don't want to pitch founders at the beginning of the meeting. If I actually really like the company, I'm going to have to pitch the founder back to want to work with us, right? There's going to come a time when I'm going to say, listen, let me tell you all the things that Fullbank can do for you, that I can do for you, that you, my partners. Don't start with that because it's irritating. Right, for sure, for sure. And, and you know, actually more than just you're missing the window of, you know, exceedingly short VC attention span, but I actually think it's a negative thing, uh, signal for the founder because so much of being successful is being good at selling is figuring out the context for the meeting and trying to understand where is this person? How do I bring them over to sort of my side? And it's almost like the founder doesn't know why they're there, right? Like as if thinking that sharing what is for the most part commodity information. I mean, if you were literally, you know, the person who uh, I don't know, figured out the right algorithm to land the SpaceX thing or whatever. Like, you know, mo most people don't have that kind of, you know, background. Um, but to me, it, it, it really signals that like this person's not going to be able to like take the temperature of the room on the fly and, and figure out how to bridge a connection. They're just sort of going through a, a script. And I think that's going to be a problem for hiring. I think it's going to be a problem to convince a reporter to take notice of this company, to get media on it. It, it, it just causes so many things to sort of fall down. And so I, I look at that as a, a, a pretty negative signal. Um, Eric, you, you used a word before that I think is pretty interesting and uh, confirmatory. And, and, and Karen, like you were, you were talking about, you know, checking out the founder beforehand and, and, and obviously you have spaces that you uh, follow. And, and I think so much of what you both were sort of talking about and, and Eric, when you said, you know, you have this box of things you look at is that you don't go into every meeting starting from zero. Now, whether you, you choose to see if this is the kind the profile of founder that you want to back or the kind of metrics that you think are going to be successful, you start out with a framework and you're basically, from what I'm hearing, checking against the framework. Like I have a view as to what kind of founders are gonna be successful. I have a view of what economics in a company ultimately provides me an above market return. I have a view of certain kind of market dynamics that I want to invest in versus avoid. And I'm trying to find out if this matches my preconceived notion of what I think is going to be successful. And, and I think that's really um, what new investors need to be doing over time is not like getting better at the gotcha questions in a meeting, but actually like getting better at making some assumptions going into a meeting of what it is you're looking for in the first place, right? Because I, a lot of times, you know, I wind up leading rounds that then I, I syndicate off to other people and, and try and get co-investors on. And when I see the questions that some people are asking, it's really clear to me 
that some of the more junior folks have no investment thesis whatsoever, that they, the, to some extent, they're, they're, they're playing a little copycat or, or, you know, so I have a seventh month old at home now and, and there's things that she does where I'm trying to figure out if she knows what she's doing or if she's just mimicking. And, and I think like that is a, a legit way of learning to some extent where you, you see what questions a partner asks, but you have to ask them in the right context. And I, and I think sometimes people don't, you know, don't do that, right? They, they ask a question and it's not really relevant to this particular deal or it's not relevant to this particular stage or, or all of that sort of stuff. And so I think like building up the conviction of what you're looking for is so important going uh, in, into those meetings. Eric, you guys have certain economic things that you look for, um, certain market dynamics. Is that based on like prior experience? Uh, you've just seen what things have worked and what things haven't or, or, or is it something else? So mostly what it's based on is bullpen is explicitly underwriting to the next round, right? So most VCs will sort of look at a company and say, can this company be worth billions and billions of dollars? If yes, I'm interested enough to do real work. If not, no. Um, we're, we're not, we're, we have a different philosophy, right? Which is, we don't think that's actually knowable in most early stage companies. Um, and a lot of things that look like they were going to be huge end up being zeros. And a lot of the things that end up being really, really big look obvious in hindsight, but when they were out raising early stage capital, no one thought they made any sense. A good example, New York based example is Etsy, right? Where when Etsy was an early stage company, people were like, well, how many, how many ladies are there in the South who want to buy crafting stuff? It's like, it turns out everybody in the world wants to buy everything. And like the TAM for Etsy is infinity. Um, but nobody thought that for the first eight, nine years of the company. I, I was at, I was literally in the first VC meeting, uh, hopped on the subway with Fred Wilson out to Fort Greene in that little apartment that the four Etsy founders were at. And coming back from the meeting, I remember looking up the market cap of Michael's stores. That's right. So again, he, that, that was the market. The kind of TAM analysis that can get VCs in trouble. So, you know, I, I think you kind of look at that and if you're trying to figure out how are you going to get signal right from these meetings? Um, I think you need to actually build coefficients in each of these things. And so for us, right, we look at this and we say, look, we're going to make investments over a two-year period. We'll invest in 23 to 26 companies, right? That's kind of our cadence. And we don't have any clue which of those companies are going to end up being worth a billion dollars and which ones are going to be worth zero. Um, and we're pretty upfront internally about that. Um, I remember having a conversation once with Josh Koppelman, um, where you know I said to him, "How much, how much insight did you really have that of all the investments you made over a three-year period, the the one that would matter was Garrett Camp's like go buy Mercedes and like shuttle people around company, which was Uber," and he said, "Of course, like we had no idea because if we'd known that, we would have just invested in that one um, and put the whole fund into Uber or as much as we could." And of course, we didn't do that. Right, and, and he, you know, and then in that same conversation, he said, "It's funny. We invested in the seed round of what became Ring, the Ring doorbell. Um, and when the Series A came around, the product was so terrible, and the consumer metrics were so bad that we passed on our pro rata in the Series A, and ended up making half as much money as we should have. And it was acquired by Amazon for a billion dollars. Right? I mean, one more example. When I was at RRE, we made a seed investment in Datadog." Um, and then the guy who, dug, who made the seed investment left to go to business school. And when they came around for the Series A, the partners decided not to take their pro rata in the Series A because the founders didn't seem like a real, the founder didn't seem like a real CEO. So there are lots of ways to fuck this up. Um, we try to put blinders on a bullpen and say, what are the milestones that you need to achieve to go raise a high confidence interval Series A round? Do we think you can achieve that on the amount of money that we could put in? And do we have visibility into whatever it is that's making you either too early or off by one to raise a Series A round now? Do we have confidence that we can help you achieve that so that when two, three, four, five quarters from now, you go out to raise 15 or 20 million, we have a high confidence level that you will be successful. What happens after that? We don't know. Um, 
when I look at our bullpen fund one, right, the, the company that ended up being the most impactful was AppBoy, another New York based company that we passed on twice when I was at RRE because it seemed like an also ran. Because Sequoia had a bet in the space called Kahuna and everyone knew that Silicon Valley companies were better. And back then, being a New York based enterprise company was actually considered a sit and off by one. Right? Most species wouldn't do it because everyone knows you can't hire enterprise talent in New York. Um, it, it turns out, right, that that ended up being the most important company in our fund. We didn't know that. In fact, it was highly controversial in 2012 when we made that investment and we ended up cutting back because two of the three founding partners didn't like it, right? So what we try to do, and it's a long answer to a short question, but what we try to do is make as unemotional a calculation as we can, knowing that this is fundamentally a probabilistic business. And so what we really need to do is we need to find the 10 companies every year that fit our strategy where we have the highest confidence. And then again, that is a mix of how high is the confidence coefficient in the people running the business? How high a confidence coefficient do we have behind the market that they're going after? And do they think the product market fit is real? Do we think the product market fit is real? Well, and, and, and one, one simulation that I like to sort of mentally play out and you guys are doing to some extent too is the, the building of a fund with these kind of dynamics. And if I basically said, your fund that does sort of seed plus pre a whatever you wherever we want to call this this round um and i don't know what number you're sort of aiming at but, but let's say that you know two-thirds or more of the seed companies go on to a competitive a if that's all i knew about your portfolio I would imagine that in the long run, that portfolio will perform pretty well, not knowing anything about what happens, right? If because if you could, you know, if if you're a we funded... don't, right? I mean, you're you're saying the thing that I'm saying, which is we don't expect to know, right? right. We want to get them graduated to a competitive Series A, and then some of them will go out to be FanDuel, which is a twenty billion dollar asset today, and some of them will get acquired for fifty or hundred million, and we don't know which one's which. If right. we do, right. we only pick the big ones. Right. And and so playing out that dynamic, thinking about your portfolio, I mean, so for example, um, I think about that when I think about um, each company on a risk-adjusted basis. And I tell myself, if I make this kind of bet 30 times, yes. what would I expect my portfolio to, to look like? And I always think about that with the 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 four days before Facebook acquired it, uh, Instagram bet, which, you know, people think about as, as, you know, a, a good bet, a really good decision or whatever. And I always look at it in the context of if you did a whole fund, 30 bets on companies at $500 million valuations with no revenue and only one logical acquirer, and you did that. You'd have a terrible fund. You probably have a terrible fund. You have a lot of ordinary income to get tax to pay. <laughs> right, right, exactly, exactly. Yeah, no, look, I mean, I, when, when I think about the companies that we invest in, um, you know, they come in and again, on sort of a P&L basis, they all look kind of similar, at least the B2B ones do. Um, so it's it, it is exactly doing that simulation, right? Which is what do we think the future holds? Because at the end of the day, like whether you do it in this kind of a data-driven way, data-informed way like we do, or whether you're really much more about vision or personality, at the end of the day, like you are trying to predict the future. It's just a question of like, how far in the future do you think you can predict, right? I mean, we're, we're a little bit humble in that we don't think we can predict the future much past the next round, right? We want to believe that the market is large enough, right? That the people have what it takes, but we also know what we don't know, which is you can only get so much conviction about those things because it's very, very hard to know, particularly given the short time frames that you have to make decisions in this environment. So I, I want to yeah, give- uh, I think many... one thing, Yeah, just real quick, I was going to say, that's part of the reason why it's always amazing to me when founders don't come in with strong ideas around what their KPIs should be or their milestones for the next 18 months. Like that's, the, that's one of the things in terms of talking about diligence, we do spend a lot of time thinking about and hearing how founders think about how they're going to focus on the next 18 months, because that's technically, you know, the 12 to 18 months 
or 12 to 24 months is the time when they're going to have to raise again. And we want to see that they can get to that. So um, I want to give an opportunity for folks in the audience to ask questions. So if you want to use the hand raise feature, I'll, I'll start calling people up. But uh, so give yourself a moment to think of a question or, or to muster up the courage to ask a question. Guarantee you, if you have a question, it's on somebody else's mind too. So there, there are no dumb questions here, especially because at times, being as we are venture professionals, we've probably felt the whole asset class is dumb at any given time. So, <laughs> uh, you know, so, so feel free to ask whatever you want. Um, Karen, I want to ask a moment about um, the, the trust part of due diligence and specifically fraud, uh, because it's a thing that, you know, um, I have some limited partners who are used to dealing with um, asset-based businesses uh, that, you know, they work at BlackRock, they, they invest in things that, you know, even if it failed, you, you have something tangible, it's sellable, right? Somebody comes in and prototype piece of paper, you, you give them all sorts of money. A, a lot of times the thing that they ask about or they worry about is like, is this founder for real or, or is this, you know, a scam or, or, or what have you. And, you know, look like you can turn on the TV and, and see all the, the, the WeWork stuff or Theranos or, or whatever. Is that a lot of your thinking? Like, are, are you doing background checks on founders? How do you, I mean, one, how much do you care about fraud at this stage? And then, you know, is there anything you do to attempt to mitigate it? Yeah. So, <laughs> There's a lot in that question. Um, we do care about fraud to the extent, I mean, I'm backed by Bloomberg LP, so we don't really want to be in business with people that we think, um, you know, have a level of, or that their ethics and values aren't consistent with ours. I, I for a while, looked not too smart because I believed in co-working, but passed on WeWork just because I, my spidey sense was wondering about Adam, you know, and, and the team. So I, I think um, we fortunately have the luxury of being pretty firm and not working with people that we, can, we have questions about. Um, but that being said, uh, in terms of the types of background checks and things that we do, we, we have, um, we use Checker as a, so we do do a it's a relatively lightweight check, but it, it does surface, you know, some of the, if there is something egregious. Um, but a lot of the time, our diligence is really focused on our, how are we going to work together? Like, you know, what does the founder need? Is it something that we can support? And that's how we start to build trust. Like the people who come in who are too super slick about having an answer to everything, um, worry me sometimes just because I, I don't, I think we're going to find out uh, <laughs> when it's too late that there's something that we could have done to maybe help them with their business. And so that's not, that's not the kind of polish that we're necessarily looking for. We're looking for people who are going to let their guard down and really discuss their business with us. And so that we can be on the same page of helping them. Trust is yeah. critical. Fraud. So it, 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 sound, it, it would sound extremely flip to say we don't care about fraud. Um, nobody likes fraud. I will say it's not something I spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, I mean, we've been, Bullpen's been around for 11 years. We've invested in about 120 companies. In exactly one situation when a company failed, we even asked the question, this seemed weird did something happen where somebody maybe took money? By the way, we hired a PI to go find out and the answer was no. So, you know, the way we do it is we try to triangulate around the founder. So if we're getting serious about a company, we do then go figure out, who do we know that knows this person? Um, and we ask, what kind of person is this? You worked with them, you went to school with them, you did business with them, tell me about him or her. Um, and we have passed on, several companies because people came back to us and said there was a lot of strange stuff in the person's last company or we found some lawsuits involving them. So 
it, again, it's, I wouldn't say it's kind of high on our list, but it's definitely part of the mix. Generally speaking, I would say, you know, trying to figure out are the company's financials fraudulent, right? Some, that's actually more typically in legal diligence than in the diligence that I do. Because um, lawyers do, and by the way, like one of the major questions is, who's the company's lawyer, right? If the company's lawyer is a major firm that we've heard of in Silicon Valley or New York or LA versus some solo practitioner that appears to be the person's cousin, right? That, that tends to make a big difference. But if they're represented by Wilson Sonsini or Goodwin Proctor, right? I, I have a higher confidence level that the company is on the up and up. Yeah, no, I agree. And I, I think about I, the risk on a relative basis. It's like, you know, chance that this person is trying to take their, you know, million and a half dollar pre-seed round and, you know, go kick it in Fiji with fake passports, you know, versus chance that they don't know how to run the company. And, and where is my highest degree chance of loss? It's probably on that they screw up the company because this is the first time they've ever run something. Also, I think the person who wants to steal the money from their investors is probably in crypto anyway. And you don't know. Really <laughs> That's true. You know, and, and I think the, the, that one of the things that's, that's interesting that's kind of evolved is people are always selling before they necessarily have the delivery, or at least a lot of founders are. And so, I, I don't know, I think it's tricky to call it fraud. It's, you know, <laughs> you have to be a little disillusioned in the potential of something to be able to... Uh, navigate through all the challenges that are coming. So anyway, it, it, for us, it's much more about the relationship with the person and how they think through stuff than it is about, I mean, hopefully there aren't the kind of people, like you said, that are flying off to some island with the cash. Well, and, and I think the other thing too that's important to look at is uh, transparency and honesty, right? Like you don't have to be uh, a thief to be, dishonest and, and you know, uh, to obfuscate what is going on, which oftentimes leads to, you know, companies kind of going sideways, right? When somebody comes in and pitches me and says, um, hey, we got, you know, this client, this other client. Actually, it, it's funny because um, somebody pitched me the other day and they, they had a client slide, a customer slide where two of the customers were actually the same company, but it was just a, a like brand extension of the same company. And so I guess my, my, my assumption is that it was actually the same decision maker. And like, that's a step in the direction. On, on one hand, it's like, I get that you were trying to make that slide look as good as possible. And technically, it is not factually incorrect to say that these two things that are two different brands are both representative clients, but it is a little bit of a slippery slope that uh, you, you know, that, that I can't ask for two different decision makers there. And, and, and the fact is whether there were 11 customers on the slide or 10 probably wouldn't have made a difference anyway. So it, it just, it did give me a little bit of pause. And, and I think like it wouldn't have been enough for me to say no to an investment, but it probably would have caused me to ask more questions about, you know, tell me how much each company is making, tell me how many of these customers are paid or just on pilots or whatever. And if they came back to me and they were super transparent and they'd be like, um, you know, listen, actually, these are my users, only two of them are paid and they're not paying this much. We're just not at that stage yet. That would have gotten me much more comfortable. I'd be like, oh, hey, you know, actually the, this, the answer wasn't great in terms of what I wanted to hear, but they were totally upfront with me about it and that's fine. If they started dancing around it, that would have, um, you know, gave me a little bit of pause. Um, and the thing to keep in mind is we have such limited time together. Right. So anything that has incongruity could be a flag that could be enough as a, of a reason that an investor will pass. So that's why it's just not even worth it. Like with that kind of thing, why not show the land and expand and get people excited like that? You know, one client led to growth within another 
you know, brand within the same universe. I mean, anyway, it's just like you said, trust is so important and honesty and transparency are so important. And everyone has like a half hour to an hour to convince somebody. And maybe even if we go back to our early, like five minutes, you know, to, to convince somebody that your company is exceptional. So it's just don't do it. So we have a question from the audience. Uh, go ahead, jump in. Um, so I'm wondering from a founder perspective, um, how do you guys see um, um, uh, warm versus cold introductions and uh, emails versus hearing about a founder from, a, from another investor, another founder? Um, how do you juggle uh, in basically approving introductions and because I'm sure you like usually are overwhelmed by, I'm sure by emails and so many in LinkedIn. So yeah, I'd just love to hear about that. Cool, thanks. Uh, Karen, you wanna start off? Yeah, it's a great question. Cold, I mean, it's just not even worth your time a lot of times for cold. The one, but again, this is just one VC. There's a lot of VCs. What I will say though is, we do try and pay attention if you're from an underrepresented community and we get a cold intro, it's, it's a different um, level of care and attention. But the reality is, again, the introduction is your, your starting point to somebody reviewing your opportunity. So to Charlie's point about sales, you know, and, and how we're looking to see how the indicators, like unless it's a very compelling cold in introduction that explains what, what, you know, something that's going to catch our attention, it's very hard to have a cold inbound work. So I would encourage you to get intros from other people. It also starts to show that you're connected, which is in some cases very important, like enterprise sales, you know, maybe not so much on dev tools, but look, we have so many dev tools companies in our portfolio that I would assume you'd know one of our other founders, or at least one of our other founders would have tried one of your products. So, um, and then regarding investors making the intro, so there's there's a little bit of caution on that because when somebody who's already invested sends a new opportunity to another investor, they're pitching their book, right? And so I much more- but You're prefer- talking about a different round, not the same yeah. round. Not uh, for, 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 like, for the same round, like Charlie, when you send me stuff, I'm always like, oh, I love working with Charlie. This is a great signal. Charlie's done some work. He's excited about this as an opportunity. And then it's a very warm type of introduction. But if it's somebody who's, who's done the pre-seed and they're coming to us for the seed, um, I would rather have the intro coming from one of our other founders or from a customer that we know or some other uh, starting point, if possible. You know, it's, it's it, look, we'd much rather see it, but I'm just telling you, if you were to stack rank the level of priority when, and, and the value of the reference source, um, you just think about the, think about the dynamics of what the signal of who's sending it tells. Eric, any differences or? I mean, that, that's pretty comprehensive. I, I, you know, I sign on to pretty much everything Karen just said. Warm is better than cold. Um, and within warm, there are different grades. Um, yes, current investor is the weakest, right? Person in my network that I trust is the strongest. Investor that's investing in this round is kind of in the middle, um, but also pretty good. If you don't have a warm intro, um, we're unusual. We'll take cold intros. Um, We've actually invested in companies that have emailed us on LinkedIn, but that's in part because we're so metrics focused, right? So if a company emails us cold and says, hey, I'm doing doing drones that clean the outsides of buildings. I've got three and a half million of ARR growing 4X and I raised a million dollars from friends and family and I'm in Cleveland. We'll take that meeting. Not everyone will. But we're like, look, this company seems like it's onto something and the metrics are really interesting. So that's why our top of funnel is a little bit different because we'll take a meeting like that even if you don't know anybody we know. But for a lot of mainstream C to A funds, if you don't know somebody they know, they just assume you're too far out of the network to back. 
So I think for for me, I don't care about cold. I, I, I don't care whether it's warm or cold. I have my email on my site. Um, because I'm focused on New York, chances are I know someone who knows you, right? So whether you took the time to take them out for coffee and show them your deck before they sent the email over to me, like I, that, that isn't that strong of a signal. Um, I've backed people where we didn't have that many people in common before. And sometimes that, that happens. And, and I, I think it's fine. Um, I always feel like it's a little too much of a dance to, to get those warm intros um, to some extent, like, it doesn't prove a lot to me. Um, that being said, there are ones where it is pretty meaningful, right? Where where somebody like a customer is actually using it, and you know somebody says, "Hey, I see a bunch of these things, and we almost never use these, and we're using it now, doubling down." Like, yeah, that's, that's great. I mean, that's pretty meaningful. It's not the re you know requirement, but to get. I'll tell you, some of my portfolio founders send me the worst quality companies, and I'm so glad they are much better operators than they would ever make for investors. Um, so it, it isn't necessarily a great signal if you like somehow manage to ping one of my portfolio founders because um, I don't I don't trust them as VCs any more than they trust me as an operator. So um, you know, every VC is different. That being said. If somebody has taken the time to go back to the selling to figure out why they're pitching me and they, they listened to a panel, they read something that I wrote, they thought a particular bet that I made was interesting and they're not just randomly picking companies off of the, uh, off of the deal page, um, that is more meaningful than just getting the generic, um, you know, everybody gets the same, uh, uh, the same one. And, and, and by the way, from a due diligence standpoint, to take it back to our, our, our main topic, um, anytime you pitch or show me something in the deck that you are connected to or a customer, that is free game for me to go and poke around my LinkedIn network and ask about you, right? So, you know, if you have a customer on your slide, I will cold pitch that company or see if I have an intro to say, are you using this product, right? And, and if the founder has never heard of that product and it's only a 10 person company, um, you know, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm not gonna wait until you provide me a reference list or something like that. Like those, those due diligence wheels are already turning regardless of whether or not you come through an intro. So that's important to keep in mind, especially as like, Somebody pitched me a thing that theoretically one of my portfolio companies were using. Um, oh, no, no. I, one of my portfolio company founders was a quote on the deck and I checked <laughs> and the company's not using the software anymore. And it was so awkward. And he's like, yeah, actually that was our co-founder that was like really into them. And he's been gone for six months and that's like kind of old. And so it, it, it wasn't particularly helpful. Thanks for your question. Um, any other questions before uh, we let these guys go and, uh, you know, um, get back to their due diligence? So we have a hand up. Let me scroll here. Uh, cool. Jump, you can uh, jump on the video and, uh, and, and ask your question. Hi, everyone. This is Sarmisha. Uh, first of all, thank you for hosting this session. This was incredibly helpful. Um, okay. I currently work at a corporate venture capital firm uh, of a bank. So... Uh, not totally new to me, but um, I wanted to ask how due diligence looks different at each stage, uh, because we currently only invest in growth. So I want to know a little bit more about how you look at things differently at an early stage or what you dig uh, more deeply into at an early stage. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, having done uh, some really late stage stuff back in my, you know, sort of GM days. Um, I found um, that, you know, look, there's a ton more information um, and, and you can get overwhelmed kind of in a deal room and a data room. But what I found actually was the most meaningful in terms of uh, due diligence was 
does this company have its information set up in such a way where it's actually easy to ask questions around their metrics? So it wasn't so much that like, I was looking for a particular number or again, like I was gonna find a customer that was sort of about to churn and I, you know, it was kind of a gotcha thing or whatever, but the better companies will be so on top of their data where, you know, you go into a meeting and you're like, hey, can we see this this way? And the, the, either they can do it on the fly or they can get back to you later that day or, or what have you versus, feeling like they're just not on top of their metrics at all or, or don't have an easy way to get you the information that they need because this is some of the same information they're gonna need for like management decisions. And if they can't get to it or have to rebuild the, the wheel to, to raise around, I, I think that's probably the biggest signal versus like figuring out something in the data itself. You guys have any other? Well, I, I think the, the later stage you get, the more quantitative the diligence becomes, right? So when you're making a growth stage investment, there, there's real operating data around sales efficiency, you know, and around sort of directional changes in margins and the you know performance of acquisition channels, right? Like in and how much OPEX you have in customer support, right? So if I'm investing in a $30 million ARR business. Right, there are a series of, of operational diligence items that are just unavailable in an early stage company. Right? In a really early stage company, you know, you, I mean, the company that I'm doing diligence on now, which I realized 10 minutes after I said it, is actually one of Karen's portfolio companies. Um, so they have, they have six enterprise accounts, right? So I can, I can know only so much about the six enterprise accounts and the 11 pilots that they have. Right, I can talk to some of them and I can sort of understand the behavior, but at the end of the day, it's a pretty chunky, pretty qualitative assessment that you have to make in an early stage company. And so I, I think diligence becomes a lot more right brain and a lot less left brain as you get earlier and earlier to the point where when you get to pre-seed, sometimes there's not a working product yet. So you're really making your assessment based on what you believe will be true about what happens when this product, if and when it is finished, hits the market. And that tends to, in my mind, to be a lot about product thesis and people judgment and a lot less about, you know, business diligence. Um, by the way, the, the other thing I'll, I'll add, when you're talking about a company that is at scale with 30, 40, 50, 100 people in it, um, one area of due diligence that I don't think probably enough VCs do is actually on the employees and the culture. Um, if you can figure out a way to find out what it's like to work for these founders or what it's like being there, um, you, there are some companies that are on the verge of mass exodus or, or, you know, mass revolt or, or what have you. And they're just really not so great working environments. And that is something that even, even some very successful companies that are growing, a lot. Sometimes uh, founders skip over or ignore serious issues about that. And, and that can really, really derail a company's success. And I think in the later stage, yeah, you're looking for upside, but if you're investing at a, you know, a, a, a valuation north of a hundred or, or what have you, um, it's a lot of downside protection too. You really can't afford to be putting that amount of money and, um, and losing it because you don't have the same upside, actually. You know, you may be capped at 10X or 20X or whatever. You're not going to get 100X that, that makes up for the rest of the portfolio. Yeah, and it's interesting because even the later you go, people are sometimes just looking for, you know, 2 to 5X, right? It's not a, and so that's much more around diligencing, you know, and they have so much more data. And the other thing is, I, I, I don't I don't laugh, but some of my friends who are to play at that much later stage, they have a set universe. Like there are only, they could literally do diligence and have a list and capture at least 80% of the universe, especially if they're very thesis driven, you know, for the earlier you go, the more there are just so many more things to, to review and you just don't have that level of data. It's well, like, all right, so we got a last question and I'll let you guys go. Uh, Vidya, do you want to jump in? 
Yes. Hi. Um, thanks for, for taking the time to share your insights. My question is around the legal due diligence aspect. Um, I'm wondering if any of you've ever run into issues at that stage and um, if, and basically just to hear your insights on that and if anything has ever impacted your investment decision and how you've maybe baked that into the business due diligence aspect as a result of those lessons learned. Um, Former lawyer, you want to jump in here? Yeah, why yeah. not jump in? I mean, the, the, the yes, no answer on whether it's ever, everything's ever showed up in legal diligence and whether that had an impact, 100% yes. Um, there have been tons of instances where things are found in legal diligence that have to get solved, right? And particularly in early stage companies by first time founders, you often find things that were done in the early stages of the company that were not done by, you know, quote unquote, best practices. Um, but in most of those cases, I would say probably 95% of those cases, with a little bit of extra money, the lawyers can generally go back and fix whatever needed to be fixed. Um, the worst examples of these kinds of situations I found are where founder equity was not handled well at the beginning of the company and new grants need to be done. And that tends to have adverse tax impact on the founders themselves. It doesn't tend to impact the investors all that much. Um, and then obviously you can have a situation where lawyers find something untoward in the history of the company, either in the corporate filings or in the financials where you have to have a hard conversation and then a, a random smattering of other things, right? I've, I've had legal diligence find an instance where there was an old press article about one of the founders that was very unflattering. And so we had to go through and decide how did we want to handle that? How much did that impact the decision? Um, I will say in one very consequential situation, I was actually set to be uh, a non-lead investor in a post-seed round, kind of unusual for us. We were the smaller of two, of two investments. And in legal diligence, some things came out that the founder was in the process of getting divorced. Um, and the other investor, for, for their own reasons, decided that they didn't want to be any part of that um, and were worried that they were going to get sued by the ex and somehow get roped in in the press. It was kind of silly, but they bowed out. We ended up leading the round. And it is maybe the one, it's certainly one of the best companies I've ever invested in. Um, so it certainly, it certainly can have an impact. Um, but I would say in the majority of cases, it's solvable. Yeah, and I and I think uh, one of the instances where I've seen that come up is um, IP assignments. Right, you you uh, hire a contractor early on to build something for you, and you just didn't properly get them to sort of sign off on stuff, and you have to get them to do so or whatever. I mean, it could be problematic if that person gets wind of. Uh, oh, yeah, no, technically I own your code and you're about to get a Series A from Sequoia, like I might want to sort of extract a pound of, of pound of flesh here. Um, so you can run into stuff like that. But like Eric said, most of the time um, stuff is solvable. I think it's a bigger issue when something that should have been disclosed uh, wasn't. And so, you know, I, I took a pitch meeting where somebody spent a whole time pitching, getting me interested in the idea. And then at the end of the meeting, um, as they were walking through sort of how they got to the idea, started off with a part that was like, well, you know, funny story. Um, and then it ended up with like, they had an assault charge against them. And I was like, I don't think of assault cases as funny stories for one. Um, but, but also like, look, like if you have anything like that um, in your history and it isn't, you know, um, something that is just up front, again, to set the context of the meeting, no surprises is generally a good rule, right? And if, if you have a story like, like look, like I am a, a, an active champion and, 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 and customer of uh, Combody, which is a, a, a gym that's run by formerly uh, incarcerated folks. And uh, it, is, it is weaved into their story, right? And uh, you know that's, that's part of the deal. And so there are lots of things where if somebody can be upfront about what it is that they're doing, um, 
you know, I, I, I think that's fine. It's the idea that somehow you try and convince somebody to bet on you and then you spring something at the end or let them find out on their own, which is really problematic from a trust perspective. And you can't, you can't have the lawyer sort of figure that out. Yeah, um, it never works well. I mean, you should really just lead with it because it, 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 this stuff always comes out, right? And, and it, this is a long-term relationship you're going to have with somebody for at least five years, most likely, maybe even up to, you know, some of the companies we back from Bloomberg Beta, you know, we're soon going to be going on 10 years, right? So it's just, you don't want to start out on that foot. Well, well, listen, um, thank you both so much for all your time this afternoon. Really, really appreciate it. And um, what is the, you know, Karen, um, all these founders uh, are going to try and get warm intros to you, uh, yeah, especially or, with your customers. Or, you can say, I mean, that's the other thing. When I say warm intros, it's like, hey, we saw you and Eric and Charlie on this conversation. That's the kind of thing I wanted just to have some sort of hook. And so I'm going to put in two pitches please come see us or email us, even if it's, you know, a direct outreach, um, Karen at BloombergBeta.com. And whether you spell it K-A-R-I-N or K-A-R-E-N, it will still come to me. And uh, we'd love to see pre-seed or seed focused opportunities. And then the second thing is, if anybody has an inkling that they want to be a venture capitalist, we have a rare open, opening on our team that happens every few years uh, for somebody based in New York um, to work really closely with me. So um, would love to uh, see any potential candidates as well. Well, and, and Eric, what's the sort of stage kind of metric or whatever where founders should start thinking about pitching bullpen? Yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're a B2B business, we generally start to get interested in the kind of few hundred K of ARR. Um, if you're a direct consumer business, it really varies, but the North star for us is, is there evidence of product market fit that shows up in your operating results? Um, if the answer is yes, we're willing to get in pretty early if we can find either performance of early cohorts or super strong customer reference accounts, that's usually enough to get us started. But if it's a concept stage or you're about to go to market, or you're still doing product development, stage too early for us. Gotcha, all right. Thanks so much uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for.